Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited to speak today with Eric Ralph. If you haven't been on one of these webinars before, this is a free series of really fun, super uh, informational and helpful information about uh, being a freelancer or being a founder, things that I thought would be applicable to people because I've seen this information coming out from uh, members of Unreal Collective in our weekly calls, and I've said that's something that we should make available to more people. So thank you, Kate. This is a hilarious shirt that I had Rush ordered. I had two of these purchased and made very quickly for the launch of the podcast yesterday, and they are some of the ugliest shirts I've probably ever designed for myself, but it gets the point across. So thanks for pointing it out. Uh, <laughs> Kate, I see you've already found the, the question area. If you guys have questions during the webinar, enter it into the chat box or in the ask a question area. We'll have time for Q&A at the end. Uh, Eric's going to speak to us for 30 to 45 minutes, and then we'll save whatever time we have left for questions. Hopefully, we get to all of them. And I know you'll probably have some specific questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. So use the chat or the ask a question button. Um, this is part of the Unreal Collective membership spotlight. Unreal Collective is a community of founders and freelancers, online accelerator to help you grow your business. Uh, soon we'll have a community membership too. I'll share more about that soon. So if you're a founder or a freelancer, we'd love to talk to you more about that. Information at unrealcollective.com. But that is not why we're here today. We are here to talk with Eric. Eric Ralph is a finance and marketing professional with 20 years of experience in pricing products and services for companies of all sizes and industries. Eric helps take the mystery out of pricing to ensure that pricing reflects the value you deliver to your customers. He's also a past president of the American Marketing Association Columbus chapter and has worked for CAS, Sterling Commerce, and Cardinal Health in addition to his own consulting business. So again, remember to ask questions. This is collaborative. I'm going to turn it over to you, Eric, and I'd love for you to give a little bit about your background and maybe even talk about the product that you had built at one point uh, that was related to freelancing. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, so my training is all in finance and marketing, so I've always been on that border between the two. And um, often you think, you know, classic marketing people aren't necessarily the most numbers oriented. The finance people aren't the most customer facing. So uh, I think. For pricing purposes, you have to be both. Uh, you have to have uh, a customer orientation and uh, a numbers orientation. So I think that's why you know, I've always been in that kind of uh, area. But we're going to talk a little bit about um, pricing today, uh, how you make money as a freelancer. I'm assuming most of the people um, on the call, I'm going to make some assumptions. Um, so first, there are three ways that you can make more money as a freelancer or you know, service business generally. You can work more hours. Um, my first assumption is gonna be other things being equal, you probably don't wanna work more hours. If you can make the same money working less hours, you'd like to do that. Um, you can charge more for your time. Uh, that's gonna be the bulk of what we're gonna talk about today, how you manage uh, pricing for your freelance time for your service business. Or you can leverage a larger team. This one I wanted to mention because I think it's an important component. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it a lot uh, today unless uh, somebody has specific questions around it. Uh, my assumption is that either you're you know, a freelancer on your own or your business is going to be the size it is. Um, but I'm not going to address you know, how you leverage a larger team to, to make money more effectively as a service business unless that is a topic you want to talk about. Um, so when we talk about pricing, you know, where do prices ultimately come from? How do people come up with it? I think there are typically three ways uh, that you can think of. Cost plus, uh, supply and demand, value-based. Um, if anyone has any other you know, methods that they've you know, used or, or thought about, you, know, you can put them in the, in the chat window. Um, I think most of them, uh, going by different names, kind of fall into one of these three buckets. And we'll talk about each of these in turn. Because uh, I think the first one, uh, cost plus, is probably the easiest for people to get their heads around in you know, a physical product. And that you think, okay, it costs me you know, 10 bucks to make a product. I wanna make money on it. Uh, so I'm gonna mark it up 10 bucks, can sell it for 20. 
there you go. Um, for a service business, that's a little harder because what's the cost that you're marking up? Um, I think the, the ultimate answer to that is you do have a cost basis. It's your time uh, primarily, as well as the time of, you know, the, the cost it takes you to run your business. Um, I do think this has uh, a place in your sort of pricing portfolio, if you will, but it's not gonna be the primary way I think most people uh, should uh, price their services. Um, the I'm guessing, I say I that, sorry? I was gonna say, I'm guessing a lot of freelancers probably undervalue their time. Right, I think that's the, the primary way is the reason is that you undervalue your time and so you underprice uh, your own services is uh, probably what I see the most. Um, also, since this has nothing to do with your customer, you could potentially be overvaluing your time and uh, charging more and driving away customers because you're, you're too expensive. But I'll say largely, I think people undervalue their time. The, um, sorry about that. The cost plus method is, you know, find one for um, certain applications, but it's not a general method that I would recommend. The, the second method that people think of when they think of pricing is supply and demand. They go out there and they say, okay, I'm going to go into social media, you know, freelancing or, you know, marketing, um, whatever. I'm going to become a lawyer, uh, offer my services, hang up a shingle. I'm going to see what everyone else is charging and kind of charge similar prices to that, uh, that sort of competitive element to pricing. Um, the, whenever, I think this again has a place in the portfolio. Um, the thing that I would always immediately think of is, well, you know, on what basis are they charging anything? Um, your competition is different from you. They might value their time differently. They might have different circumstances. They might have, you know, a better or uh, lesser reputation in the market. So they might be able to charge more or less than you could. Uh, so it's an input. But again, it's not one that I would necessarily say should be the primary thing driving your pricing strategy uh, as a service business. Um, this one is very easy to get into the trap of, oh, if I know that um, you know, the going rate for you know, whatever service I provide is you know, 100 bucks an hour, I'm gonna price at 95 bucks an hour, make myself seem attractive. Um, considering where you want to fall in that competitive set, is a very important piece of the puzzle, um, but it's not the only piece. The last one, and the one that I think we already got the, the question on, is really value-based pricing. Um, how much does the customer actually value the, the service that you're delivering? This one, I think, is, uh, again, a, a crucial piece of the puzzle. Um, it's also the one, unfortunately, that's difficult for many people to get their arms around. It's sometimes hard to understand, okay, if I'm uh, you know, providing a service, how much value is that service really truly uh, delivering? And we'll talk about some ways that you can kind of align on this, uh, ranging from sort of general you know, trends to very, very specific, uh, depending on you know, what you're able to measure for your customers, what you're able to uh, prove, um, and what maybe industry statistics you can rely on. Um, you also can't, if you can articulate this exactly, there's also a component here where, that you can't avoid where if the customer values it by $1,000, they're not gonna necessarily pay you that whole $1,000. Um, there's gonna be some negotiation there. They wanna benefit from it too. So if you're del delivering $1,000 in value, you might only be able to charge $500 because they want to get $500 too in some respect. Eric, have you read Breaking the Time Barrier? Uh, I haven't actually, no. It's, uh, it's, it ties into this value-based pricing a lot. And I, I wanted to get your thought on this because his, uh, his standpoint in this, and I think it's the, like the founder of FreshBooks or something that wrote this. And it mm -hmm. works through this like uh, fictional story of a couple characters, one guy who's just getting into freelance and learning about value-based pricing as opposed to hourly pricing. And so the examples they give is, uh, I don't know if this is actually in the book, but an example would be if you're making a website for a client, a barbershop in your local neighborhood, they would 
pay less for that website as the amount of work that you put into it that like a Honda would, you know, mm -hmm. because it could be about the same amount of work, but the value that it's providing to that client is very different. Right. And this is kind of, I think of value-based pricing as kind of the opposite of cost plus in a way, because cost plus, everything is internally focused to you. You know, what's your cost? What's your value of your time? How much money do you want to make? Value-based is all about the customer. They don't necessarily care how much time you spend on things. They care on the value you're delivering to them. So to your point, if you know, they're, you could be doing the same amount of work and for a really large client, that might be really valuable. Um, but for a smaller application, it might not be as valuable. Um, so you always have to take that into account. Um, this one again is kind of the, the most, you know, difficult to get your arms around. I think uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, and it again, isn't necessarily the way I would price everything. Cause the other reason that you don't want to price everything on a value basis is the, you know, deal has to be attractive to you too. So if it's going to cost you, you know, more hours of your time, but you can only deliver a thousand dollars in value, um, you may not want to, to offer that, to take that kind of project. Um, so now that I've said that there's three ways, uh, cost plus supply and demand or competition based or value based, and I've eliminated them all, you know, an astute observer might be wondering, well, you've just eliminated everything. So what do I do? Um, which of these three methods should you use? Yeah, kind of waiting for your answer. The answer is really all three. Uh, kind of look at all three and try to align your pricing accordingly. So in this graphic here on the right, what I'm trying to articulate here is the, the, the floor that you should be considering is the cost that you incur. So the, cost, the value of your time, uh, the additional cost it takes to run your business, um, any additional costs that you're passing through to your your customers. Whereas the green is the additional value that you're del delivering to your customer. So from that perspective, anywhere sort of above the red and below the top of the, the green is sort of fair game for pricing. Uh, these braces on the side, um, I'm kind of showing to reflect what the competitive situation might be. So for any industry that I'm aware of, there's a range. There's low cost providers, there's premium providers, there's kind of folks that go right in the middle, sort of the good, better, best in virtually any industry. If you understand that uh, dynamic, that kind of tells you, okay, if my costs are above, you know, the, the minimum price, then I'm can't really be the low cost provider. I have to stake out some sort of value proposition for myself. Um, and if I'm not the absolute best in the industry, you know, I might have to be somewhere in this range, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, other things being equal. Now, this is all, you know, kind of very theoretical at this point, right? But in a little bit, we're going to talk about how do we actually put numbers to this and really get at the, the value you're delivering. Uh, the, before we get to that, I am going to point out that while we're going to put numbers to things, um, these aren't necessarily cut and dried things. When you, if you look at your competitors and you say, oh, you know what, they're really good. I'm at this and I'm really good at something slightly different. Different customers will value that differently. So for customer A, you might be here, your competitor might be above you, but for customer B, you might be above your competitor because they like what you deliver more than what they deliver. Um, that gets into segmentation strategy, all those types of things. At the end of the day, you just have to really understand your customer and really understand the value that you're delivering uh, specific to that customer. Um, and that will be the best um, that you can do in terms of pricing. Eric, I think it's, I think in a weird way, it might be on that previous slide, the value versus cost graphic. I think it might be easier for us to identify the value that we're providing to a customer sometimes than still identifying our own cost since it's our time. Mm -hmm. Can you help us think and break down a little bit more how we should start thinking about our costs and our times so that we don't undervalue that, but we also don't overvalue that? 
yeah, uh, I'll move to, the, to, to this, which um, hopefully is still legible on the, on the screen. Um, and I'll kind of talk through how you determine sort of that cost basis for what you're doing. Um, the way that I break this down is, you know, typically a lot of freelancers, they start off as, you know, uh, they might start off as an employee of someone else and then transition to freelancing. And um, that can help, you know, fill out some of these things. But you might think, okay, I want to make a certain salary and let's say, you know, $60,000, whatever it might be. Um, you can't just then say, okay, there are 2,000, you know, work hours in a, in a year. Um, $60,000 divided by 2,000, that's 30 bucks, right? Um, because that salary that you want to achieve isn't the only value of your time, the only cost you're gonna incur. So there are benefits uh, if you're going to, you know, buy health insurance for yourself, which I hope you do. Um, there's, you know, taxes that you have to pay uh, as self-employment tax and, and other things. Um, so then your total is already more than that $60,000. There are also costs that you incur, you know, as a freelancer that you don't see as an employee. So for instance, um, you know, printing stuff out, you know, buying yourself a computer, you know, the value of the, the internet connections, uh, just monthly bills that you're paying that your employer would pay for you, but now you have to end up paying yourself. Um, I just lumped all of these into just one big number. But the next piece of the equation is, you know, how much time you want to spend working. So I'm going to assume 40 hours a week. Um, and then throughout the, the, the year, you're going to typically take, you know, some holiday time, some vacation time, some sick time, etc. cetera. Uh, all of that takes away from your available time to deliver customer value, to really do the customer work, right? Similarly, um, 100% of your time will never, ever, ever be spent working on customer projects. You have to allocate time out of your week to market your business and really work on your business. So this is time that you should have in your weekly weekly calendar saying, I'm going to spend time you know, marketing and selling and really improving my business. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by service development time or improving your business. This is things like doing um, continuing education for yourself and whatever it is that you that you do uh, to hone your skills, to improve your skills, to add new um, programs, new offerings to your customers that you don't before. Just to give, just to make sure I'm clear, yep. holidays that says seven, that's seven days. Correct. Marketing yep. time and service development time, it says six. That's six hours yes. a week? Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, sorry, I should leave this a little bit clearer. Um, so what that gives you at the end is that whereas you typically think 40 hours um, uh, a year or a week times 52, that'd be 2,080, you actually only have um, 1,280 hours once you subtract out um, your holidays, vacation days, and uh, the time to spend, you know, on your non-billable time every week. Um, by the way, I'm not telling you these are the right answers for you. I'm saying these are just like an example, you know. Uh, so if you want to spend, you know, a lot of vacation time, you can put that in and it'll change your answer. Uh, if you want to, if you think that you need to spend more time marketing, you can do that as well. Um, I would say, you know, on average, these are approximately correct uh, in terms of 15% of your time on marketing and 15% of the time on, on your own business um, based on what I, I've seen in sort of industry statistics for freelancers and service companies. Um, but you know, your mileage may vary, so to speak. Um, at the end of all of that, you end up with um, a target billable rate or what, I'll, what I'm gonna be terming your cost to, to provide that service of roughly $62. Um, if you think back to when I rattled that off to begin with, 60,000 divided by 2,000 is 30. This is you know, more than double that. Um, and so this is really what it costs you um, to be in business. 
And you might be thinking, but the 60,000, that's not really a cost. That's what I'm getting. And that's true. But if you separate sort of the ownership of the business from doing the business. Um, so if you were just going to be an owner of this business, uh, you could theoretically pay someone a salary to do all the work that you're going to do and, and do these things. And that's what you would have to pay them uh, to do it. So it is a cost to you. It's the value of your time. Um, anything that you get above this. Um, so we'll get into how to measure sort of the success of your pricing uh, in a little bit. But if you end up on a given project actually getting more than $62, um, that's good. That's really profit that you're making because you're doing a really excellent job um, managing your business. Um, if you just get $62 in uh, every, every time, that's okay. That's certainly, you're making the money you wanna make. Um, and then anything below that, if you're only making 50, you're not really hitting the goals that you've set for yourself. You're not really hitting the value of the time that uh, you thought you were. Uh, so kind of, this is also not just something that you wanna set up and say, this is my rate, but it's something that you want to create and then monitor over time to make sure that you're hitting the goals that you have for yourself. Yeah, so let me, let me break that down and make sure I'm still understanding. If I were to bill my time based on this calculation, I said, okay, I wanna make $60,000 this year before taxes and, uh, that's my goal. If I build $62, $62 an hour and build 1,280 hours a year, you're saying I would hit that goal? Correct. Got it, okay. Um, and so when you're not hitting the goal, it could be for either reason. You might not be building enough hours, you might be actually using too many hours, um, or you might not be sort of hitting your, your revenue goal in that respect. Um, We'll talk about more about that in a second and how that gets impacted by the, the manner in which you price. So I'm gonna go back to the, the deck here and really separate out um, your services into sort of three kinds of services. And bear with me for a second, because this can be a little bit you know, um, difficult to, to parse out because we're not used to thinking about things this way. Um, but really think about, okay, what, how clear is the outcome to your client? Uh, is it something that they know exactly what they want, um, but they just don't wanna do it themselves? Um, or is it really more exploratory and they're really not clear on what their outcome needs to be and they want you to sort of advise them on that? Um, second is for you, for you uh, how defined are the costs? How confident are you in your ability to deliver the project um, for a given you know, amount of effort. Uh, if it's something new that you've never done before and you've got to learn and you get new skills, that's kind of undefined. If it's something that's right in your real house and you've done you know, 50 of these projects before and you know exactly how much it takes, then that's very defined, right? And then really what's the core reason that you're being hired? Are you being hired for your expertise, your experience or your efficiency? And the, the first two questions can kind of help inform the, the third. So if the client knows exactly what you're delivering and it's very defined for you, you're basically more often than not being hired for your efficiency. If it's very undefined and very unclear, um, it's you're probably being hired for your expertise. And otherwise you're being hired for your experience. I'll talk a little bit more about this because I know this is not, um, I think this is worth spending some time to get super clear. So the three types of projects. Uh, an expertise project, you're really creating a one-of-a-kind one deliverable specific to that customer. It's new for you, it's new for them, highly creative, leading edge, and really the client is really participating in that project to a pretty high uh, degree. Um, so this might be, you know, designing, you know, uh, a very custom, you know, building or uh, home. It might be some very advanced, um, or actually you can think of like a psychological help in, in, in a way as, as something like this, where if you're really trying to get, provide a service to customize to that person's problems. Um, in the experience column, um, it might be the first time the client goes through it, but not for you. You've gone through this, uh, you've been to this rodeo before. Um, it's more process driven and you have a proven process for how to, to execute it. Um, the client is still involved, 
uh, but more on the ex on the specification side, not necessarily the execution of it. Um, so this might be if you're if you're a lawyer, um, it might be that you get hired because they know that uh, that they're about to you know go public. Um, and they want someone who's been through an IPO before, or they're about to go through some funding round and they want someone who's advised on that kind of thing before. They've never been through it, but you have as the service provider. The last is efficiency, where both probably have experience with it uh, and it's very outcome focused. Uh, and it's very focused on low cost and pretty low client involvement. So this is something where if you are, you know, almost like an outsourcing kind of thing, where it's not something that they wanna do yeah, you know, as a core part of their business, but they need to have done, um, they might outsource that uh, to you. They might have experience in it, but they know what the outcome they want. They want. They know roughly what they pay for it today, and um, it's really about that you can provide that more efficiently than they can do themselves. Um, I know I went through a lot right there, um, so if there are any questions, just let me know as we go. But um, I really like that framework. It's uh, it's a much more you know, it, it, it's a framework, there's structure to it. It's more of a scientific kind of narrowing down of what type of project is this? Right. You know, I, I haven't really thought before outside of, you know, not all projects are sort of created equal as a freelancer. Even if you focus on graphic design or you focus on copywriting, I hadn't thought that there are those three different reasons why someone would hire you specifically for this role. Right. And you can kind of think in your, um, in your portfolio, you probably have a mix of these kinds of projects. And depending on where you are in your development as a professional, you, you might initially start off with very efficiency-based things and then add you know, experience and add expertise later. Um, and typically, an expertise project won't be the first one someone hires you for. Um, they will hire you for other projects and then they'll come to you and like, oh gosh, I got this problem, I don't know what to do, can you help me? Uh, that's a good sign that you're in an expertise kind of project. Do you think? Do you think it's fair to say that an efficiency project is sort of uh, a lot of times competing on price? I feel I feel like a lot of people that I work with get into this almost race to the bottom, and those are probably more of the efficiency related projects. Yeah, absolutely, uh, and and I think that that you deal with each kind a little bit differently for that reason. Um, the, your least least price sensitive are going to be the, these expertise projects because they're coming to you because they trust you to solve their problem. The efficiency is they're coming to you because they think you can do this very efficiently, but if they can find someone more efficient, they'll probably switch uh, or could switch. Um, and then the um, experience is somewhere in the middle, right? These expertise projects are a little bit um, riskier in some sense because you don't know either how much effort you have to put into the project. You don't know what your um, what the outcome is going to be. So it's a little more exploratory. Um, for that reason, um, I tend to recommend that you use strictly an hourly rate here. Uh, it's going to limit your upside in some ways, um, but you're going to essentially um, help pay for your learning in this because you're going to develop uh, additional skills as an outcome. So you're not just going to get paid the, the dollar amount, you're gonna get paid in good experience too, if that makes sense. Um, the experience projects are where I think you can actually make um, the most money um, in that you're really able to leverage the fact that, okay, I know exactly what I'm delivering. If I can deliver that, like learn to do that better over time, I can still charge the same amount, put less of my effort in, and really start making more money as a result. Um, the efficiency projects, these um, can be helpful because often um, if it's something that they just need on an ongoing basis, this, this might be able to form sort of a um, ongoing revenue stream for you um, where you know every month uh, or every year they pay you to do this. Uh, and it's just kind of an ongoing thing. Uh, if you think about you know, a tax professional, you know, filing tax returns, I think would fall into this. You know, it's it's somewhat, if your returns are more complex, it might get into the expertise area, I'm sorry, the experience area. But I think a lot of it is just about efficiency. Or like a uh, social media and email marketing retainer. Right, exactly. Um, so if 
and I, I kind of glossed over this, but for the experience projects, this is really where you would use sort of a project fee uh, rather than uh, an hourly rate or a monthly, right? Because it's still a defined project, a defined scope. Uh, it's not ongoing like an efficiency project is, but it's also not, um, you know, completely amorphous where you have to charge on an hourly basis. That's interesting. Can I can I drill down on that a little bit then? So you're yeah. saying the reason that you recommend hourly pricing on an expertise project is because it's not defined as to the entire scope of the project. So you might kind of bite yourself in the ass if you don't charge high enough. Right. Interesting. So like for an experience project, I know, okay, this is going to take me a hundred hours or whatever number of hours it is. So you know, your cost is defined in an expertise project. If it's very open-ended, um, you don't necessarily know you don't have, you've, you've not done 10 of these before. Um, it's kind of a new thing for you. So you might not know that that's what it's going to take. So you have more risk if you do an hour hourly. So this is where I'm saying, you know, you can kind of see some sample proposals. We already kind of talked about this a little bit of how you would do this. Um, the project fee also lets you manage your business better because if you start treating experience projects like expertise projects and you do an hourly rate, um, the better you do at, better you get at your job, uh, the less you get paid. Um, meaning if this particular type of project starts off, it takes me a hundred hours um, and I bill a project fee, um, if the next time it only takes me 90 hours, I'm still going to make that same amount of money. And then I just paid myself for 10 hours that I didn't spend. Um, whereas, uh, in expertise, if I bill on an hourly rate and it takes me 10% less time, um, now I've just cut my own revenue by 10% as a result. You want to reward yourself for getting more efficient, for doing a better, um, better job. And that's what really the project fees allow you to do. Uh, efficiency does as well. Um, the, the difficulty there is that that it would be a little bit more transparent to the to the customer potentially. So you might get more price pressure there um, to pass that savings on to them as well. Hmm. Um, so before I go on to some negotiation stuff, um, any other sort of thoughts or questions before you talk about that? This is super interesting. This is really turning things on its head for me. You know, I was I was fully in the camp of uh, just not charging hourly whatsoever. And I hadn't thought about these situations where you're kind of brought on to explore and co-create a solution. And you just don't even know what the scope of that project is. Right. Uh, and your point about experienced projects making you more money as you become better at them if you charge a project fee just makes a ton of sense. <laughs> um. So I want to talk a little bit about negotiation. Um, this I could you could probably spend like an entire hour on negotiation itself. Um, so I'm just going to highlight some some key points um, that if you if you do these three things or keep these three things in mind, um, I think you'll be you know, well on your way to being an excellent negotiator. Um, the first one alone I think is is crucial, which is always connect the price with the value delivered. So if you um, quote a project fee of say ten thousand dollars, and they say, "Ah, oh, you know, I can't really do ten thousand dollars. It has to be, you know, nine. Find something in that project and say, "Okay, we can make it nine, but I can't do this part. You're going to have to uh, live with, you know, just two revisions, or you're going to have to um, do some of this work yourself, or you know, whatever it might be, depending on your your market." It might be that, okay, instead of managing all your social media accounts, I'm only going to manage, you know, Twitter and Facebook, um, nothing else. Take those out of the proposal. Never just lower price and offer the same exact service that you did before. Um, doing that just encourages them to negotiate further. Um, and you want to make sure that the value you're delivering is tied to that price so that um, if you're getting something taken away, you take something away from the, the customer as well. That will really help you keep that, um, that value a whole that you're delivering. And then the other part that I want to stress is the more unique and valuable your services are, the better you are at what you do, the less important price becomes. Um, and 
you know, when you think about the three types of projects, if you get those expertise projects, those are going to be ones where it's really not that price sensitive at all because uh, they're really coming to you because you're that trusted trusted advisor. Um, it's it's price is less important also to your existing customers than to new customers. Uh, so existing customers they know the value uh, better than uh, someone new. Um, the last piece here. Um, is don't be afraid to fire bad customers. Uh, do business people that value your time? And um, what I mean by that is when you do projects, you should always keep track of your time, even if you're not billing for that time. So for example, if I quoted out a project fee of $10,000, um, I want to know how many hours I actually spent on that project so that I can say, all right, I budgeted uh, 80 hours, I spent hundred hours. That one really went over budget from a cost perspective. That's what I mean by a bad customer. If you see that as a pattern over time where a customer is just more demanding, uh, they ask more of your time, they push the envelope on the services that they ask of you and aren't willing to pay for it. It's one thing if they're like, hey, you know, I, I'll pay you an extra thousand bucks, but I really need this. It's when you th accidentally throw those things in for free or they demand them for free where you know, at some point, you just have to say, "Yeah, you know, I'm sorry, you're great. You've been you know, a good customer for a long time, but I think it's probably best if you found someone else to do this work for you. Um, then spend that time, you know, marketing to find a better customer to take their place. Um, the flip side of all of this uh, that I just kind of referred to is time management. Um, you need to price your time for both billable and non-billable. And I actually recommend tracking your time for both billable and non-billable time. Um, if you focus, if you just track the hours you spend on customer projects, um, you will spend less time than you need to on marketing. You'll spend less time than you need to on, on your business on improving uh, the services that you provide. Um, there's, you know, a saying, I can't remember, you know, who I first heard it from that, you know, um, People pay attention to what gets measured. Um, and so measure uh, your time so that you know that you're spending it where you need to spend it. I think that's a Peter Drucker. What gets man what gets measured what gets measured gets managed. Yes, I think that sounds right. Um, so just to kind of reaffirm some of the things that we talked about, you know, um, a good price is good for you. Uh, and your customer. It has to have that sort of mutual uh, satisfaction associated with it. Um, if it's not, doesn't make it worth your time, then it's not you know, good for you. If it's so high that no one would ever hire you for it, it's not good for the customer um, or good for you, I guess, in the long run. And, um, you know, all your time is valuable. So make sure that you price yourself and you don't undervalue that time. Um, you need to price your services where you have that time. Um, and if your customers always want to negotiate, um, then you really haven't shown the value that only you can create. So now I'm going to switch back to um, the spreadsheet and go to another tab on it. This we got a question if this spreadsheet would be available or if you can make a copy of this available. Yes, it will be. Um, so I have two other tabs down at the bottom here. Um, now, for the expertise projects, like I said, you're going to kind of use the billable rate. The only uh, caveat there is kind of say something at or above your target. Don't target below that. Um, for your project fees, um, this is one that I just put together to show the differences in, in how you would look at this. This isn't how um, I would present it to a customer or anything like that, but how you might think about it for yourself. So if your target hourly rate is 65 bucks and you think it's gonna take 120 hours for that project, um, your cost for that project is $7,800. Um, that's not the price you would quote to your customer. That's the minimum price that you would do this project for. That's like the cost of your billable time. Like the amount of billable time is $7,800. Correct. Um, but now if it's a marketing project and, um, let's say that I'm targeting an audience of, you know, a hundred thousand people, 
uh, I'm going to get a response rate of a quarter of a percent. That means I'm going to generate $250 a lead. And I know that leads are worth $100 to this particular customer. That means when you do the math, that this project should be worth $25,000 um, to the customer. So where do you price? Um, I think the answer is it sort of depends. Um, the $25,000 to the customer reflects the absolute maximum they would ever be willing to pay uh, for that project if they believed all these numbers. More than likely, they're going to want to actually make a profit on it. So they're not going to want to pay $25,000. They might be willing, though, to pay fifteen, dollars um, which is almost double what you would get from your you know, hourly rate. Um, so that's where negotiation comes in, kind of having a feel for the customer. Um, and a feel for the competition. So if you know the competition is pricing these projects at you know 12,000, that gives you another data point to look at. Um, whether you price above the competition or below kind of depends on how you're positioning yourself. If you're really an expert in this field uh, compared to your competition, then you would price a little bit above them. Um, or if you're just kind of like one of many and you can't really, don't want to distinguish yourself that way, then you can kind of price to the competition. Um, there's not a definitive right answer here. Um, this is just sort of, sort of for you to know, okay, here's the span. Um, if I, if we went back to, yeah, you got, this is like your green and red blocks here. The cost of the project is your red block and the project value is green, the top end of the green. Right. Makes sense. That's awesome. Um, so then if we look at the efficiency side, um, uh, we can go through a similar, a process where we say, all right, our cost for the project is um, if I, it's going to take me my hourly rate sixty bucks, and it's going to take me hundred hours, you know, over whatever span of time. Um, cost of the project six thousand dollars. If this is a an, 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 let's say this is an annual fee or something like that, and right now their cost is. Um, let me actually make these different numbers to make them less confusing. But let's say that their um, cost for whatever it is that you're doing uh, is 60 bucks. Um, and this might be, if it's strictly like an outsourcing thing, they might say, well, you know, we currently pay someone 60 bucks an hour to do this for you. Um, you might wonder, well, why, how could this even be possible, right? Um, anyway, uh, I'll, I'm going to skip for that. So the if the cost reduction is five percent and their total units is ten thousand, they're doing this ten thousand times, um, and it's thirty thousand um, dollars. If you're much more efficient than they are, um, so you're spending less time. It's not that your hourly rate is different; it's that the amount of time you're spending is different. Um, you're much more efficient. Then this is again the range that they they'd be willing to spend up to thirty thousand dollars. Um, you'd be willing to accept nothing less than six. So then again, that establishes the red and the green ranges. And then you can kind of incorporate the competitive element to say, you know, how much should I, should I price my services at? Can you give me sort of a real world example here of like what may be a situation where a company is spending $30,000 on something and I as a freelancer could come in and be more efficient? Sure. Um, so it might be a situation where um, <coughs> if... Um, and typically this will be an area where it's not that person's, you know, expertise, uh, or area that they want to spend, um, a lot of time in for that, for their company. So for example, I know, uh, a freelancer and what he does is it outsourcing for small companies. So he'll go to companies that have some sort of it requirement. They, you know, they need, you know, computers, you know, network uh, access, you know, internet, um, stuff like that. Um, and they don't want to hire, you know, an IT person, um, cause it, it would maybe cost them you know, a lot more, uh, as opposed to just hiring someone, you know, as a, as a part-time, uh, freelancer. Um, and so what he does is since he does that for a, a bunch of companies, um, he's able to be much more efficient than they would if they tried to add, um, like if it's a chiropractic office, let's make that up. Um, if the folks in that chiropractic office tried to do their own IT, um, unless there just happens to be someone on staff that's really good at it, 
they might spend a lot more time on these tasks than yeah. someone who does that professionally, right? And it could be the doctor in some of these small offices whose time is worth right. a lot. Yeah. And so every hour that he tries to spend, you know, figuring out why the internet doesn't work um, is a huge cost to him, right? Yeah. Um, and he'd much rather pay someone that can just come in and figure it out in 10 minutes and do some other stuff besides. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So um, I did say we had a question on the... Yeah. The question was from Kate. And her question was, my clients have been frustratingly lax in tracking statistics related to any projects I've done with them. Things like event materials and professional documents, uh, like proposals to use to respond to an RFP or communicate information to the public. Mm -hmm. How can I price my services or value if I don't quite know the value I'm bringing other than anecdotal, oh, people love the invitation, conference materials, et cetera. So she's kind of saying, how can you look at, you know, in that... Uh, Second sheet you had where you could show, you know, these assumptions of how much value this is providing. Yep. How can she do? Uh, how could she break this down for her type of work? Sure. So I think the ideally, you're right. You you would get data from your customer specifically to say, hey, in similar projects, we got this many attendees, um, and, and or whatever it happens to be, or you know, they we got this many leads, etc. From this initiative, whatever it is. If you don't get that, um, the, the ways that you can show your value is you can look for sort of industry standard um, metrics. So you can look for publications in whatever industry you're in to say, okay, for um, you know, this type of, of marketing project, um, your response rate is typically going to be you know, a quarter of a percent. And so if we're targeting this audience and then for your customer's industry, um, a typical lead is worth this. Um, you can find those in, in other sources. Ideally, this value per lead is something that your customer gives you to say, hey, for every customer you end up bringing me um, via this website, via this you know, marketing plan, what have you, it's worth, I know what that's worth. Um, if they don't share that, you can go back to industry statistics. Um, the other thing that you can do to sort of supplement that and show that you're better than the industry is do uh, surveys of your customers. Um, I'm an advocate personally of the Net Promoter Score methodology, which is a super simple survey. Um, it's just one question and basically says, um, would you recommend um, my service to somebody else? Uh, one, absolutely not. Ten being absolutely every day. Um, and then the top two boxes, nine and 10, are really what you measure against um, some others. I don't want to get too much into that methodology, but measure that those top two boxes in particular to say, you know, 80% of customers would um, highly recommend my services uh, again and use that in conjunction with this to say, I'm better than average in terms of satisfaction. I think I can drive more value than this and kind of have those conversations. Um, so I think if you don't get that data directly, uh, you can align to it using uh, available information on your industry uh, and your customer's industry, and then very simple um, survey results. Um, and the thing I like about the NPS survey is it is just one question. Um, so if your customers aren't willing to fill out one question for you, um, that's probably a sign that you're doing something wrong. Uh, they probably should be yeah. I also a big fan of NPS, as you know, and there's there's a variant that I also like, which is the two question NPS, <laughs> which is the one question one to ten, and then the second optional question of why did you rate it that way? Oh, yeah. Um, but they only have to answer the first. I think there's a huge opportunity for freelancers, and something they don't do a lot is really take the the reins and lead the conversation. Yeah. And and state these things and show you know I understand how you can measure these the results of these campaigns and if they don't have the information that they're already giving you and if they won't provide it go out do that research make those assumptions yeah. and then put the impetus on them to prove that that's not the value to them right. which would then require them to give you the real information yes that's a, that's a great point Jay because that the one thing that 
when we went over this earlier, I said, don't show them this part, but absolutely talk to your customer about this part. And you know, whether you use something like this exactly or something you know tailored to your business to say, how are you delivering this value? And use that in conversations with your customer to say, hey, you want me to create a website for this, you know, this is, or this kind of marketing plan, whatever. Um, here are the metrics that um, we can measure, the value that we're delivering. Um, and then, like you said, put it on them. If they disagree and they say, no, there's no way this project's worth $25,000, tell them, well, then, you know, which of these numbers is wrong? Because the, the, the math doesn't lie. Uh, are, your, are your customers not that valuable? Um, do you not believe that this is the you know, industry response rate? Um, are we going for a smaller market than you're saying? You know, what in this isn't accurate? Um, and then that will also help on the back end. If you set ex expectations on the front end to say, okay, after this project is over, um, could you share with me you know, what our actual response rate was? Um, you know, what your actual value per lead generated was? Um, so that the next time we look at these projects, um, we can you know use that as a metric. And I think yeah. set those expectations up front, you're more likely to get it on the back end. Uh, I think if you times they might just not keep track of that. They might not think about uh, tracking it. And so then when you ask on the back end, they don't have any idea. And this and this doesn't have to be combative. It's it can be proposed as, hey, I want to help us make sure that we really can measure the value being created here so that we really understand where we should be focusing our energy and our folk and our, you know, our time. Right. And so uh, I really like this as a tool of collaboration, but also leading the client, which a lot of clients, I think, appreciate because it puts their mind at ease like, oh, I've hired the right person. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think if you have this type of conversation where you're showing that you want to deliver value to them, um, that's only going to put them at ease ultimately to say, okay, this isn't just someone that wants to, you know, get my money and they don't really care what the outcome is. They really want to know. Uh, great. Well, that was our only question. Does anyone else have any questions for Eric and Eric, while I give folks a chance to answer my question about whether they have questions or not, um, I will get this sheet from you or a copy of the sheet from you and send out a follow-up email. Where can people connect with you or learn more about you and what you're working on? Um, so you can connect with me on uh, Twitter um, at Eric underscore Ralph, um, or you know, shoot me an email, uh, Eric at takeaimcolumbus.com. Um, that is for my you know latest project, which is not you know, pricing related, but uh, something that I'm uh, passionate about as well, which is um, giving kids in a fun, uh, interactive art experience um, modeled after or inspired by the uh, St. Louis City Museum, if you're if folks are familiar with that. Um, if you want to know more about that, you can also go to just takeaimcolumbus.com. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions afterwards, please do follow up with me. Just shoot me an email, you know, um, respond to me on Twitter, um, whatever you like. Um, I'd be, I'm, I like talking about this stuff, so I, I might inflict more of it on you than you uh, mm -hmm. actually care about, but i um, happy to help with any questions that you have after the fact. We just got a question from Conroy, and he says, in your IT example, is there an advantage to being a freelancer versus forming a company? Uh, it's a great question, and um, I think that if you, regardless of what you're doing, um, and I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I, I recommend um, if you're a freelancer, um, talking to a lawyer about if you should form an LLC um, instead of just being basically a sole proprietor. Um, if you're giving any kind of um, advice um, or in terms of IT, if you're giving uh, support and you're responsible for any kind of security uh, or data concerns, um, I would recommend personally, and again, I'm not a lawyer, but um, getting not only forming as an LLC, but also getting uh, general liability insurance. Um, so that if there's like in that example of uh, the chiropractic office, um, I know that there's HIPAA requirements around patient data and, and needing that to be secure. If for some reason you're, you're the contractor there and 
there's a, a breach of their their data, um, you could be responsible um, as being the person that, that set up that system. And if you aren't an LLC and you don't have insurance, um, then your personal assets could be exposed, as I understand it. Um, so I would encourage uh, looking into again, no matter what you do, if it's if there's if they're relying on it in any substantive way, and I hope they are. Um, I would look into that, both of those things. Um, even there's probably less risk from like a marketing perspective. Um, but you know, it's probably worth having the discussion with a lawyer in, uh, in any case. Yeah. Well, we've, we had this question come up with, uh, a freelance group that includes a lawyer and he was like, get an LLC <laughs> just from the standpoint of liability and, 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 uh, not assuming some risks. Um, and, uh, and just for me personally, just uh, for full disclosure, um, all my freelance work, um, my consulting company, we, I formed an LLC for it. So, um, And I think what Conroy may also be alluding to is this question of freelancer versus entrepreneur, which mm-hmm. is sort of an arbitrary line of, eh, not totally arbitrary, just depends if you buy into this methodology or not. Freelancers, if you're not working, you're not making money entrepreneurs, you've created some sort of productive asset engine that is making money and it may be a team while right. you're not directly working. And so right. in, in this IT example, my thought is it kind of just depends what you want for your life. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. And, and that gets back to the, the thing that I've said I wasn't going to talk about unless I was asked, so I guess I was asked, um, is the concept of leverage as a way to make more money. Um, so one, and I'll just talk about it very briefly because I realize we only have four more minutes. Um, the, the concept here is that if you have other people on your team and your skill is managing that team uh, to make them more effective than they would be on their own, then you can sort of make more money that way. Uh, so the, effectively what you have to do in, in those cases is charge your hourly, hourly rate of, you know, 60 bucks or what, what have you. But then um, you would hire people that make less than that um, so that any time that they, uh, your cost basis basically goes down for any time they contribute to the project. Um, that's a very simplistic way to, to talk about a, a pretty complex topic. If anyone's thinking about trying to do something like that where they might engage with someone else for a portion of their business, uh, let me know. That's probably something that we could you know, spend you know, some good time talking about. Yeah, it becomes a question of also 1090 or 1099 versus W2. Right. And I've, I've seen a lot of friends of mine who were freelancers and making good money as freelancers who thought I should build a team and scale this thing up. But a trap a lot of people fall into is you're basically going down the route of an agency. And so as quickly as your revenues increase, your cost can increase if you're hiring W2s and then you're into a cash flow question of are you guys getting your your billable on time to actually pay this headcount that is now here Um, and you avoid a lot of that with a 1099 but that is a topic for another day my friend (laughs) yeah (laughs) what's more than we can cover in next 120 seconds yeah yeah all right everybody well thanks for joining us uh we'll send out this replay it will immediately become reviewable after we end the broadcast here, but thanks for taking time. Uh, we'll have more of these to come. Another one that we did just about a week ago was with Brad Miller, who is a small business lawyer. It's called, it was about contracts. So if you're a freelancer and you have questions about contracts, I'd recommend looking at that as well. I think you can find that just by clicking my face over there in the chat and it will be another one of those, but uh, related to this would highly recommend. Eric, anything else as a sign off? No, I just, uh, thanks for all the time. Again, if you have any questions, follow up with me. All right. Thanks, everybody.